Technorazzi Live, the show that lets you ask questions of metrology experts. I'm your host, Dirk Ducharme. Well, today we are in North Kingstown, Rhode Island, home of Hexagon Metrology's North American headquarters. And in fact, today we're in front of a live studio audience. Hey, let's hear it, all right? Okay. There you go. You can hear them. Well, as all of these people know, and as you probably know, Hexagon Metrology is the world's largest manufacturer of metrology equipment, including a lot of brands you probably recognize, Brown & Sharp, Leica, DEA, and Romer. Well, here at its 123,000 square foot North Kingstown facility, Hexagon manufactures Brown and & Sharp and Sheffield Bridge CMMs, as well as the Optive Classic. This facility also contains their R&D lab, uh, a CMM refurbishing operation, a calibration lab, and of course the training facility where we are standing right now. Well, today we are really excited to bring you a brand new product from Hexagon, the next generation of Brown & Sharp CMMs, the Brown & Sharp SF Shop Floor CMM. This is an entry-level CMM designed from the ground up based on specific input from Hexagon customers. It's got a small footprint, higher accuracy, extended temperature range, it's shop floor hardened, and a lot more. We're also going to show you a new multi-sensor measuring machine from Hexagon, the Optive Classic. But remember, anytime during the show, you can send your questions to techno-live at qualitydigest.com, and we will get them on the air. In case you forget, the email link is also below your player page. So remember, that's techno-live at qualitydigest.com. Email your questions. So let's get started. Right now with me is Zach Cobb. Zach, what is, what is your title? Uh, Director of Engineering. For Hexagon. Okay. For Hexagon. Yeah. <laughs> Good, glad to know that. All right, so tell us about this, this brand new product. Yeah, brand new product. Uh, it's the 454SF, which is uh, kind of the newest shop floor machine designed here at the North Kingstown facility with the team we have here. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a shop floor machine, small footprint, as you mentioned, high, uh, uh, higher accuracy than our current offering. It's, it's robust, both in terms of contaminants, uh, vibration environments, et cetera. Um, and it's kind of a completely integrated solution that we have now with uh, the, the a touch screen monitor being mounted on it. Uh, uh, housed in the stand is all the peripherals and um, we have uh, it on casters so you can roll it around. <laughs> it rolls on casters. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you mean by shop hardened. Uh, so, uh, shop in, in, uh, for shop floor machines, uh, we, th the environment is less ideal, uh, less than ideal for coordinate measurement machines. And typically, our lab CMMs all operate with air bearings. Uh, this is a hard bearing machine where we actually use recirculating ball bearings on uh, steel rails, um, and do it doesn't require air, so it can actually operate in a little bit more of a a, 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 a dirty environment. The whole machine is covered with bellows and uh, covers, so all of the ways and everything are covered. Um, and uh, we've actually uh, integrated into the drive system an actual cleaning system that helps to keep the drive clean during operation. So as the machine moves throughout its volume, we're actually cleaning the drives during that time. Well, let's back up a little. Tell me a little bit about what the issue is with shop air and why you would go with, with hard bearings rather than, than shop floor air? Sure, so shop air is, uh, typically it's dirty, right? Okay. Uh, and by dirty you mean uh, oil, water? There's oil, water, mist, okay. water okay. In, in the shop air. Beyond that, the air bearings actually require, because they run on a very small cushion of air, they require a very clean surface in order to operate. Um, so if you put them out on a shop floor, all that collecting on your ways can cause the, the machine to actually have problems uh, measuring. So okay. uh, we actually use hard bearing machines when we put them into an environment like a shop floor. Okay. Um, uh, beyond that, we've actually we've done some things with the encoders that are a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Uh, the the encoders on this machine, the, the 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 scale system, it's the same scale system that we've always used. We use a lot of the same technologies that are in our current offering, um, along with some improvements. And one of the things that we did to improve the the. The, the robustness of the system is to actually turn the scales upside down, put the encoders pointing up, and what that does is if anything does get in underneath the bellows, it doesn't settle on the scale system, there's no cleaning of the scale system, so it actually should keep the, the system an awful lot cleaner. Sure, so the combination of the bellows, the self-cleaning, everything upside down, yeah. pretty much you're not going to have to worry about your, yeah, the uh, idea your scales. Is, yeah. yeah, the idea is to really kind of minimize the amount of maintenance that, uh, that the user will need to do in order to kind of keep their CMM in top shape, tip top shape. Okay. Tell us more. So, um, we have uh, we have the touchscreen. That is, this is a little bit new for us right now. Um, we, the the user interface experience is uh, 
for this machine is kind of driven to be real uh, in an execution mode for the shop floor. So you put this thing in the shop floor and it's used by people out there just uh, operating to, um, to, to run part programs. Yeah, so I was going to say, I've noticed uh, earlier when you were setting this up that there's, uh, the, the user interface does seem very straightforward. It's yeah. basically just big push right. buttons. Big yeah. push buttons, that's the yeah. idea. Is you'll set up a, a system that we have an STI interface that we offer. You can also uh, create your own interface. Um, but big buttons that you actually press and it'll run a part program entirely on its own. So, okay. so then this is going to be familiar to people who run uh, any modern CNC or yeah. something. You basically just got your touch screen. That, that's yeah. the idea. It's wholly integrated here. So okay. we'll, we, have the, we have the touch screen and you'll notice there's, there's an absence of a keyboard. There's okay. an absence of a whole uh, workstation next to it, which is very typical of a, of a lot of the system. So we actually tried to integrate it all. And the, the, the concept is that in a, in a shop floor environment with lean manufacturing, you're constantly moving things around in order to try and optimize your flow on the production floor. This machine, everything's in integrated. We actually have it on casters, but there's also feed underneath it so that if you want, if you want to set it down, you can actually just put, uh, put down the, the feet and actually lift it up off of the wheels. Yeah, let, let's talk about that a little bit, moving this around. Yep. Um, it's interesting size. There was something yeah. you were telling me about that I didn't realize. Right. So in, in the product environment, in, in the product requirements, we were asked to okay, make it really easy to get off of the pallet, make it really easy to install, and let's make it really easy to move around. One of the requirements to actually have it move around was let's make it so that it goes through a door, a standard thirty-six. Just a standard inch, door. Yeah. Standard thirty-six inch door. It's actually thirty-five inches on the inside, and this machine is just a little bit narrower than that, so that you can actually fold in the monitor. Um, and uh, wheel it through a door. And yeah, so you can basically take it basic in, anywhere in, it in a regular through. office environment as well as a shop you environment. Can you can just it roll it through the door. That's yeah. absolutely correct. Okay. Almost, <laughs> almost anywhere. <laughs> I, thought it was I don't know when I carry it up the, up the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing now for temperature compensation. I understand you've extended the range yep. of this over, over previous, uh, uh, previous models. Right, we've extended the temperature range. We're actually 15 to 40 or uh, 15 to 40 degrees C, and that's 59 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we actually monitor the temperature at a number of places throughout the machine to kind of keep, keep track of what's going on in the machine, both in terms of reliability, but also to kind of keep an eye on the structure. We do some thermal compensation in the structure uh, for that so that we know if things are growing, we change, we change uh, a model inside the compensation map. Um, we also have a part temp sensor that you put on the part uh, to compensate for uh, part temperature if, if, if right. that's needed as well. And I, I, I noticed you did something structurally. I was wandering around behind, I, I asked you the, about this before the show, I was wandering behind the machine and I noticed that there were, um, were looked like slots cut right. in, in your, uh, what, on the back side of your, uh, uh, back side of the bridge, right? That's right. So the, the, the structure of this machine is, is, is such that we, we designed it so that it will be good with vibration, but in doing so, we, we, we lock the entire structure down to the granite very well, and we actually lock it down in two places on, uh, on the ways. And um, the, when the granite grows and shrinks with temperature change, so does the steel, everything grows and shrinks with temperature, th they grow at different rates. And in order not to, to create any uh, distortions in the metrology frame, what we do is we actually relieve some of those stresses in the back uh, in the back upright with a spring. So essentially, as the, as the steel tube on the top grows and shrinks, it's the back end sits on a spring and it doesn't, it, it, it allows it to move okay. without kind of being forced and, and causing bending. And, and, and by spring, actually, in this case, you're really just talking about a split piece of, we, we a took, split piece of metal, essentially. We yeah. took the split piece of the metal, we thinned it out to uh, in some certain places, kind of uh, key places. We actually filed for a patent on some of the, some okay. of the technology. And, and all that, that way the, the, you don't get the deformation all the way down through your, uh, through, down into your, your plate, right? That, that, that's correct. It, what it does is actually stops the ways from bending. So our okay. metrology structure is okay. on the top, and what we don't want to have happen is have the metrology structure start to, to bend and change shape. Okay. So it, it, it helps keep the integrity of the metrology structure. Um, what, about, uh, what about vibration isolation? So vibration, uh, the shop floor has an awful lot of vibration. You're near machine tools, cutting tools, there's fork truck traffic that comes through. That's, that's just the nature of the shop floor. So one of the things that we really took a look at is how do we, how do we make this machine essentially immune or as immune as we can to vibrations. It has a, lot, a big impact when you're trying to measure microns. Sure. So um, it, it, we've done a couple of things. First off, the, the historically our shop floor CMMs have been of gantry style and that's what this is uh, again. 
And the gantry style has a, has a high first structural resonance because of, because of the, essentially the closed loop of it. Sure. Um, that helps to keep it immune from uh, vibration. Beyond that, we have some passive uh, just pads between that and the, and, and the stand. And as an optional add-on kit, we can actually we have um, uh, airbag isolators that we can put underneath the machine that go between the stand and uh, this in a really uh, noisy environment. Okay, um, before we go any further, let me just remind people that you can send questions, now is the time to do it, uh, to techno-live at qualitydigest.com. Uh, any questions you got on the, um, the Brown & Sharp SF, send them in right now and now's the time to start talking about it. And we do have actually one question that came in. Um, somebody who actually I think was looking at a close up and they noticed uh, you got a, a, a touch probe in there. Mm -hmm. Is this a touch probe only? Um, yes, right now we've introduced it with touch probe only. It's available with our TESA, TESA Star probes. Um, also, of course, we'll uh, support the Renshaw probe line as well. Okay. Um, touch trigger only right now. And uh, but we're certainly we're certainly working on and will introduce later in the year a scanning version. Of okay, and so you, you also have a, a, a probe changer that looks like that's probably a, an, an option there. Yeah, yeah, probe changers are typical options that are available on our CMMs are also available on this. Uh, limited, of course, to the uh, touch trigger probes. Okay, all right. Um, I guess kind of a, a, another thing to mention is that we have uh, the stand is kind of wholly integrated now. I mentioned it briefly earlier, but the the the, uh, the controller is actually uh, bolted to the back of the machine. The, the computer's stuck in the stand. We have the peripherals in the bottom of the stand for any of the probing accessories that we have. So all that stuff is kind of housed in the stand. The, really, the only connection to the to the to the to the facility is a plug. Okay. So when it comes time to move it, unplug it. And, yeah, and it's, I think we forgot to mention that that's, it's just a standard 120. Uh, yeah, it's 120 volts uh, yeah. standard. Yep. Yeah, just any as long as you got a standard 20 amp circuit on your yep, on your absolutely. wall, most everybody does. You plug it in, and I notice there's actually very little hanging off, uh, hanging off this. I don't see any cables. Um, no. uh, I notice on the back there is looks like like you mentioned there is the controller yep. hanging on the back. We have the controller, but we've done a, 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 a we've paid real attention to kind of cable management. Uh, okay. One of the things we didn't want to have is cables running all over the place. Sure. They they they're either tripping hazards or unsightly, et cetera. We've actually routed a lot of the cables in through the through the structure. We have some uh, specific cable chases, um, and they all go down and, and land right inside of the uh, the back of the, the the cart on the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know we got to uh, we got to move on kind of the kind of the software and the operation of okay. this. Was there anything we Want to touch on before uh, before you did that? Um, I think that I think I think we've touched most of it. Did we get okay? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have a chance later on if people have specific yeah. questions, we'll be able to bring you back on. Um, meanwhile, we're going to move on to our next presenter, who is uh, and thank, thanks very lot. Right. Okay, uh, this is actually Dan Jean Los. Yes. And Dan, you are the uh, what's your title? Applications manager for the East Coast. Okay, and you're going to run us through what uh, kind of the, the operating system and yes. uh, actual operation of the machine, right? That's right. Okay. So system runs with a, a touch <clears throat> touch sensor interface for the shop floor, and uh, you can see here if you want to see what kind of probe you need to load for this particular job, click on probes, and click on the start menu, and it immediately shows you a picture. Uh, and graphics of uh, two by twenty on this side and a, a different probe on the other side. Okay. Oh, so that's actually for your probe for your probe selection. That's right. Okay. All right. And then in the probe changer, it actually you can set up a picture of what's in each station of a six station rack. So in this case, we're only using two stations. And if I want to know how to set up the fixture, uh, we're using flexible fixturing for this particular job. So uh, it tells you where to put each clamp and put so, each post. So this is actually kind of set up instructions that you can build right into the, the part program, right? That's right. Okay. Set them up ahead of time, digital camera, it snaps a shot, and then a little paintbrush and you have the, this view. Okay, and then actually loading the part. So Again, just a picture showing you how to, how to, how to mount it into the fixture. Okay. That's right. So it's only loaded one way. So what I'd like to do now is actually run the program. So. You have the measure, big measure part button, and we're going to execute the program. Gives you a little drawing view. Okay, so this is this is actually just a, a little uh, a screenshot of that part of the CAD drawing or whatever that we're going to that we're actually going to be measuring, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So click start. All right. And CMM will get on its way. Take off and 
Start measuring. So while that's, while that's running, um, let, let's talk a little bit about what's on the back end of this. I mean, so mm -hmm. this is obviously a very straightforward, easy to use uh, user interface. That's right. What's, what's driving it? Oh, behind this is PCDMS. Um, okay. It's the most widely used uh, CMM software in the world. There's over 43,000 seats of PCDMS. And uh, what's really nice about that is if you buy this system with uh, PCDMS, there's a very good chance your customers or your suppliers are using the same software. So um, you'll be able to share programs and not have to reprogram your part. Okay. Uh, we did have a question come in uh, recently, by the way. Questions are coming in. If you want your question on the air, techno-live at qualitydigest.com. This question's from Ryan. I think we actually touched on this, but it's, it probably bears repeating. This just runs on standard 120 volt power, right? That's right. Okay. All right. Yep. 110, plug in, and it's running. So right now, uh, this is a, on a, with a taste of wrist. It's a five degree increment wrist, so it can index to uh, many thousands of positions. And in this case, we're getting into a hidden groove underneath the bore. So we'll hit take that with a few different wrist angles. Okay. While this is running, we actually have uh, different CAD views. So the uh, operator can see how his, his uh, progress, his parts going, and you know, whether things are in or out of tolerance. OK. Uh, actually, another question just came in. Um, Joe wants to know, can I roll the machine on casters without having to recalibrate it? So yes. we talked about how easy this is to move around. So mm -hmm. once you move it. Yeah, move it into place. It does not need to be recalibrated. OK, yeah. there you go, Joe. So I'm sorry, go, go ahead and uh, oh. interrupt you there. So uh, as it's running, it is go flipping through various screens. And you can move them as well. So now we have a top view. And uh, each of your dimensions from the piece of Demus part program are available here. Uh, there's a side view showing two holes and the distance between the holes. Okay. Now I noticed that as you're as you're as it's measuring, it's it's uh, doing your data comparison or your your uh, kind of your quality control checks on the fly. So That's right. you wouldn't actually even necessarily have to run through an entire part program. If it was a lengthy program mm -hmm. and you saw that one of your one right. of your specs was way out, you might as well just. I mean, if you wanted to, you could stop it yeah. right at that point. Yeah, right? you can cancel okay. the program, stop. So you don't have to wait for the whole thing to be done in order to go and look at your your results. That's right. All right. Now this is hooked up with a uh, stylus changer, so now we're switching to a cylinder probe, which is nice for measuring threaded holes. And uh, we're going to come to the front of the part and measure some threaded features. Okay, good time to, uh, while it's doing that. Uh, another question, this is from uh, John Brown. Mm -hmm. PIMS, Tool and Machine. Is the speed of the machine comparable to the one CMM? Uh, the speed of this machine is 250 millimeters a second, which I believe is just about the speed of the one machine. So okay. it would be very comparable. All right. And all the data here from this program is getting fed to our uh, SPC software, uh, Data Page Plus. Um, but we also can export out to Excel or um, CADs, CAD packages for reverse engineering. OK. Uh, yeah, what kind of, what kind of uh, CAD export do you guys su support? Because that's a question yeah. I know we get qu quite often when we do these uh, demos. Yeah. We do iGES and STEP. We export to uh, Unigraphics, SolidWorks, CATIA, any of those major so the packages. Usual, usual cast of characters then? That's right. OK, all right. Sorry, you continue on while I yep. get through our characters here. I'm going to go back to the main screen. Okay. And that program's just about done. All right. <clears throat> oh, yeah, well, that, that, that other question we'll get to in a little bit here. I'm just kind of sorting some of these as, as we're going along here. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. You want to see how easy it is to run this part program? Yes, exactly. As a matter of fact, I'm, it's strange you should ask that because I just got, somebody was just asking about how, uh, how easy this, is this to learn. And that was sure. kind of one of, my, one of my things I was thinking about earlier when we were mm -hmm. looking at this and you were running me through it, is it looked like it was really just a matter of once you have your measurement program, right. that it pretty much is really just hit a go button and you're, and you're off and running. Yeah. So we'd assume that the learning curve is, is pretty good on this. Yeah, very short. Okay. And uh, we have our uh, CFO here like to actually, uh, actually try yeah. running this program. The CFO of, 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 of Hexagon Metrology. That's here. right. Okay. Uh, well, shoot, bring him on. All right. <laughs> oh, oh, let me get a spare mic here. Hold on one second. <laughs> Hello? So I, 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 I see by your badge that you're, uh, you're Mark Delaney. 
that's it. And you're, you're the CFO? Yes, I'm CFO of uh, Hexagon Metrology North America. So you're, you're, you're the guy who uh, you know, does all the bean counting? Is, is that what you do? Actually, I do that. No. I don't miss a bean either. <laughs> you we get, a, we get every right. one of them. Well, now we can see if a CFO can actually run the Brown and Sharp SF. So let, let's here we go. Let's see you do it. All right, we're going to do it. So it's this easy. Oh, you pressed click. the first button, right? That was good. Click. Okay. Another click. Wow. We just have to wait a few seconds. And, I'm, in, uh, I'm impressed, and it's it's actually moving now. And there we go. So uh, as, unlike finance. <laughs> Our great team here at Hexagon has made metrology very simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> hey, let's hear it from Mark. Right. <laughs> well, if a CFO can do it, then... That's right. Yeah, maybe even an editor can do it, <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath to see if I ever hit the right button. Okay, so actually he started, basically this is the, the same program we're, we're running through That's again, right. right? Okay, all right. Um, by the way, reminder, again, any questions, send them to techno-live at qualitydigest.com. And we are going to, in a, in a few minutes here, we're going to go on to another product. That's okay. Go ahead and still send your questions, even if it's a question related to the SF. We will come back later on the show and field those questions again. So continue to send them in, even, if it, even after we leave this product behind here. So just want to do one last check. While I'm checking for any last emails, is mm -hmm. there anything else you wanted to touch on? No, pretty much... Uh that's it, we covered all the major bases. Um, any kind of touch sugar probe right now and we're working on contact scanning probes. Okay, so this was the, the Brown and Sharp SF shop floor CMM, shop hardened, roll it through any door, runs on 120 volts, no shop air. Uh, this is really a, a perfect entry level machine for a, a smaller, uh, smaller size CMM. That's right. Okay, perfect. Well, we're gonna move on now to our next product. It's gonna take us a couple minutes to change machines out. So while we do that, let me tell you that uh, you're gonna watch a little video here, about a three minute video on Hexagon 2012. This is Hexagon's huge yearly event that they put on every year. It is a fantastic event. If you've never been, you definitely got to go. And this year it's in Las Vegas, so double the fun. So uh, we'll be back in about three minutes with the Optive Classic. Well, Hexagon aspires to play a leading role in the effort to meet the challenges of tomorrow. We're looking ahead 10 years into the future, and all of us sitting in this room are going to be experiencing mind-boggling changes in our world. You've got great accommodations, you've got great food, you have motivated people that are here because they're interested and they're invested in their technology. From our experience coming to the, the Hexagon conferences, uh, they go out of their way to uh, facilitate, accommodate, and make it as uh, user-friendly as, uh, as could be. The power of networking here is, is tremendous in as much that we can share similar problems, similar ideas, and it's also an opportunity to touch base with people around the globe with mutual interest which you wouldn't otherwise do. It's a good opportunity. You talk to many people and you get new ideas all the time and how to solve maybe your next question or your next challenge. So that's really interesting. You get new ideas all the time. I've seen something at this conference that you don't normally see and that's users standing in pairs or threes sketching. These people are sitting down illustrating processes to one another. This is exactly what you want, is that you want to inspire users to talk to each other and say, this is what I do, this is how I do it. And the other guy says, oh hey, I do that, but right here, I do this. The, the Tech Expo has so much here to see. Um, so many companies represented, so much technology. I've been actually really surprised. It was, it was a really positive experience. The breakout and the sessions have both been very professional. Uh, we did a couple of training classes on Monday for the paid training. 
Uh, they, they were excellent. Uh, the speakers did a great job. It was great to get that hands-on experience with the machine to be able to try the various things that they were lecturing about. It was, it was awesome to be on a computer moving data around and how do you do this, how can you do that, how can I be more efficient with what I'm doing. Um, they had shortcuts for me that um, will save me time and, and ultimately money. We went to Universal last night and it, it, was, it was fabulous. It was the best backyard party that I've ever been to. It was, it was actually incredible. Hexagon, they just pulled out all the stops. Well, as you can see, uh, Hexagon 2012 is a pretty exciting event, and seriously, if you can make it out to Las Vegas, you definitely got to do it. You won't regret it, I guarantee you. Okay, well, we're back now with uh, a brand new product, another one from uh, Hexagon Metrology, the Optif Classic, and here to tell us about it is Dan Farnsworth, right? Yes. And Dan, uh, what's your title? I'm a product manager here at Hexagon. Okay, great. Well, okay. tell us about uh, another brand new product. All right. So the Classic 321, is kind of our entry level uh, offering into the world of vision measurement, right? It falls into our Optiv product family, which is, is a pretty big, pretty broad product family of optical measurement systems here at Hexagon, right? So let's talk a little bit about this unit itself, this model. This model was originally developed and manufactured at our Hexagon facility in Switzerland, okay? And about a year ago, we decided that there was a need for this particular product in the United States market in all North America. We went out and we talked to our customers. And we found out pretty quickly, it didn't take very long, that we weren't going to be able to, if we really wanted to succeed, we really weren't going to be able to, to live with the delivery times that we would ex experience you know, trying to import this from overseas. So after some deliberation, it was decided that if we really wanted to succeed, we needed to have a production cell for this particular unit right here in the United States. Right? And so here we are right now in North Kingstown, Rhode Island. Okay. So. So basically, you wanted to make sure that you were closer to your to your North American market, right? Exactly. So, but it's still there's still uh, versions of uh, this product is also being manufactured in Switzerland still. Also, still being manufactured in Switzerland and as well as China too for that market. China for the uh, so basically keeping market. keeping the the manufacturing pretty much regionals in order to reduce uh, shipping times, right? That's correct. Okay. Right. And just to give you an idea, um, when we first decided to bring this product over here, we kind of flew the trial balloon. We, we sold a few targeted units, and then we supplied those those orders. Uh, over from our facility in Switzerland. I don't know if you ever shipped anything via ocean freight, but there's a lot of variability bringing things over, okay? And Slow the, being one of them. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that being the operative one. And, and based on uh, uh, a lot of factors really out of our control. And we're getting delivery times of like 10 and 12 weeks on this, and okay. even longer in some cases, all right? But in contrast, all right, we get an order today for this product. Out of this facility, we ship in two weeks. Well, okay, so about a quarter of the time. Maybe. It's yeah. a, a, and more. And that's it. so on a product of this level, like in, you know, the entry level end of the spectrum, that's like a game changer for us. Yeah, well, I can see what you said. So, so for, you mentioned uh, from on a competitive level, you wanted to do that because if your lead times are way out there, you may lose, you may lose, the, uh, you may lose the sale simply because somebody's going, I don't want to wait 12 weeks for, exactly. for a product. Okay, exactly. yeah. So, as another result of this decision to bring this over, there's some, also some cost benefits as well. All right. And let me give some examples of what I mean. If you're not shipping this product over um, from overseas, you don't need to burden the price of the product with ocean freight. Oh, sure. If you don't need to import it into the United States, you don't need to burden the price of the product with the cost of duties to get it to our customs. Okay? Um, there's also labor differences. The cost of labor in the United States is significantly less than it is in Switzerland. All right? So when you took all these things, we took all these factors together, we rolled them up. At the end of the day, we were able to take this product and we're introducing it to the market and a 20% reduction of what we would have had to if we had chosen to just simply import it from our overseas facilities. Okay. So, so you've reduced the, the time to get time it to your customer and, and, the, cost. and the cost. Yes, right. yes. Okay. And there's another uh, benefit of this as well, and, and that's that at a time when you know, so many manufacturing jobs are moving overseas, we were able to actually create a few right here in the United States, right in Rhode Island. 
And it's kind of a trickle down because you know, a lot of the parts that we use to make this particular machine, we source locally. So a lot of our local suppliers are also benefiting from this decision as well. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that is, that is one thing a lot of U.S. manufacturers are looking at. Is there some way we can reshore? Is there some way we can bring things back in? Well, if you're finding ways to reduce your, your, your costs here or make it less expensive to make here, then obviously you're bringing jobs back to the U.S., which is a, which is a great thing. Exactly, and yeah. that, that's happening here, and this is something we're very proud of this facility. Yeah. So. It's terrific. Um, so it's a very exciting time for us right now. Introducing this product really kind of gives us access to different parts of this market that we didn't really have the right product for in the past, all right? And, and the kind of markets that you'd find this type of a product are, are certainly um, the medical industry, which is obviously big for vision. Um, uh, manufacturing electronic components is big, and as well as automotive and uh, you know, aerospace yeah. as well. Yeah, so anything that's making, basically I think what you said is, is Products, even though it has a larger volume, this really you're looking at fairly fairly small uh, well, I'll objects. I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll, okay. I'll give you an idea of that. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about the machine. All right. So this is the classic. This is our. This has the. It's a, obviously a benchtop unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. It has the smallest footprint of any of the products in the Optiv product line. Okay. And we have some big units that that have some of the largest measuring volumes in the entire industry. But again, you know, we're talking here small. Okay. So this has a measuring volume of 12 by 8 by 6 inches. And you, know, you can put some you know, medium-sized parts on there. But that's not really where this thing excels. Where this thing excels are small parts. Right? Stuff you can put in the palm of your hand, okay. um, parts you can put in the tip of your finger. Okay? It excels at measuring uh, features on parts that you might actually, uh, not actually be able to see very well with your eye. Okay? And that's where this product kind of lives. Um, it's a very robust construction. It's got um, uh, uh, mechanical bearing, so it, it's a very stable product. And, I noticed, and, and this is also uh, this is a, uh, a multi-sensor machine, right? I, uh, I see a touch probe here, but I'm assuming there's also a. Yep, and I'll talk. I'll talk okay. about that in a minute as well. I'll okay. Talk about it in a minute. Um, Sorry, I'm jumping ahead on you. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing about this machine, this is the kind of machine that you want to use in a temperature-controlled environment. Okay. okay. So it's a little bit different from the shop floor machine you saw before. You know that can be used in areas with a lot of temperature variation. This one you okay. want to try and keep um, with something that's controlled. So let me tell you about all the features, all right? You're, you mentioned the multi-sensor uh, feature of this. Every machine that ships out of here is obviously got the vision sensor, but it's also going to have the capability of putting a, a, a touch probe on it as well. Okay. Okay. So whether you buy the machine initially um, with the touch probe or you want to add on later, it doesn't matter. Either way, you'll experience all the benefits of a of, of true you know, multi-sensor measuring machine. So that's good. Um, another feature that, that is, has been very popular right now is there is actually a laser, red laser behind here. You can't see it from the angle. But what that does is, it's not a measuring laser, it's, it's a location laser, okay? So what it does is it shines uh, the laser beam right on the part and it's right at the, the, the center of the field of view of the camera, all right? And so where that really comes into play is, sometimes these cameras are, are high magnification, zoomed all the way in, and it's difficult to find where you are on the part, okay? Uh, okay, uh, right, right. So, so it's a kind of, a, it's, a, it's basically a laser pointer. That's all it is, okay. exactly. So that helps you. And, and that's how it really saves you some time, especially on uh, creating initial inspection programs. You can, you can find the features much easier. Like I say, you can, you, once you're zoomed in, sometimes it's difficult. Yeah, I know uh, you end up kind of, without something like you end up searching with the camera, trying for a to long zero time, for, yeah, exactly. okay, okay, gotcha. feature after yeah. feature. So, yeah. Especially when we're talking very small features. Yeah. All right, another good thing about this machine is it's made out of granite, okay? It's got a granite construction, it's got a granite base in, in the neck and the back. And what's good about that is granite is stiffer, right? And the reason you want stiff when it comes to measurement machines is, in this case, you, there's less flexing and less vibration, right? So if you can take those two components, reduce those, then you can make the machine move faster, okay? okay? And, and increased measuring speeds are good because now you might actually be able to, depending on the size of the part you have, you can maybe get some uh, increases in your throughput as well. What, what, what kind of measuring speeds are we, are we talking about? Um, this particular, in all three axes, this measures 100, and, this, the machine moves, doesn't measure, it moves at 160 millimeters per second. Okay. So, so it's pretty quick. But most importantly, the one thing that really sets this apart from comparable units in the industry is the fact that it ships with PCD mis vision measurement software. Okay. okay. And for that, I'm going to bring Dan back oh, again. Okay. And he's going to talk about that. Well, thanks a lot, Dan Farnsworth. We got two Dans. Dan Farnsworth. Okay, Dan, thank you for introducing that. <laughs> It's like, uh, well, it's like deja vu all over again, right? That's right. Okay. Um, so now we're going to look at 
PC Demos, but this is a, a vision version of it. Yeah. So uh, a lot of customers are already used to the CMM, uh, for PC Demos for CMM. Now well, the only th things they have to learn is the vision tools. So okay. it makes it a lot easier for a shop that already has a CMM to switch over to a vision machine. And uh, the same guy can program both machines. Even the CFO. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to run this part program. Okay. And we're starting out with the uh, touch trigger sensor just to locate this part. This is an automotive uh, connector. And uh, we're just going to do a simple 3 2 1 alignment. Now, this can, this can switch between, uh, in any parts program, this can switch between the touch probe and the camera? Yes, and they have a relationship between each other, so okay. um, you can switch it live and um, oh, I guess don't have to switch. That's what we're doing now, isn't it? Right. Yeah, right now it's measuring the hose barb, and uh, it's doing a profile check. Now we're going to highest magnification, and we're doing a Z measurement with a camera. Okay. Now, is that typical? Would you usually do a Z measurement with a camera as opposed to with your touch probe? You can do it either way. Um, you know, if you can do it with a touch probe, don't go that way. But um, certain things like gaskets and plastic parts. Oh, uh, sure. You don't want to touch them. Yep. They flex, so you've got to use the camera. Good. Okay. Uh, while that's running, let me ri remind you, if you have any questions, send them to techno-live at qualitydigest.com. We have gotten some more questions that came in on the Brown and Sharp SF. Don't worry. We will get to your questions at the end of the show. Right now, we're talking about the Optive, so send your questions in. Okay, you can see we're, uh, one thing that makes PCMS quite distinctive from other CMM softwares is uh, we used uh, the full CAD model to program the part. So um, it makes it a lot easier not have to enter in all the nominals sure. and tolerances. And um, that's kind of a, a new thing in the, in the vision industry. So you brought in, you're saying you brought in it, this directly in from, from a CAD model? That's right. And what, graphics, SolidWorks. Uh, there, okay, that's just what I was going to ask. <laughs> and I know somebody else is going to, too. Uh, yeah, what can you bring, what can you import into PC Demos or yeah. uh, PC Demos Vision? Yeah, most common is iGIS or STEP, but uh, we do direct CAD interfaces to Unigraphics, uni SolidWorks, okay. Katia. Um, this particular hole here had a lot of... Um, fuzz or burrs on it, and the software automatically filtered out those uh, features. Okay. That's it. Oh, that was quick. Okay. There's the full solid model. Okay. Um, you know, we had a question, and I think this applies to, it was a PC Demos question. I, I want to get back to it because it, you can probably answer it at this point here. Uh, let me just find it. Had a bunch of SF questions here. All right. Sure. Uh, it must have been this last one. Ah, okay. Uh, L. Louis. Okay, Louis. Uh, is, does PC Demos have the ability to record temperature and humidity? Uh, we record temperature in the program. We have a temperature sensor that can uh, record that and make adjustments. Uh, humidity we've done in the past. That's a special option. Okay. So is, is what he's saying, so I understand the question is, mm -hmm. When you measure a part, part of the data that's stored with that part measurement was the, the ambient temperature. Te temperature of the part, the was ambient temperature, whatever, just kind of stored with it so you knew what your measuring conditions were? That's right. Okay. So you store it with the program. If, you know, the standard is 68 or 20 degrees Celsius, but uh, if it's, it was hotter, it'll be with the program. Okay. But also, the software can make adjustments to the measurements to bring it back to the standard 68 degrees. Okay, so this is really just more for somebody wanting to know. I mean, just. The, a lot of people like to just have as much data as possible on measuring conditions. So even you're, right. so you're being compensated for it, the temperature compensation is going on, they sure. at least have in their own records, hey, this is the conditions when I was measuring sure. this part. And Including humidity, a, you say, perhaps, yes. is an option. Okay. Yeah, so if you had a flyer in, a, part, in a, a report, you could check the temperature and say, oh, it was measured at a higher temperature. Okay. All right, make it back to our... Um, while I'm, uh, I'm still checking our emails here, mm -hmm. is there any, anything else you want to, uh, want to touch on in terms of the capabilities of uh, PC Demos? Uh, report, uh, report, report outputs, how about that? Sure. Yeah, the report's always uh, available. Uh, you can just toggle over to it, and uh, PC Demos will display all your measurements. So, um, and this camera is capable, the standard uh, lens is capable of 180 uh, magnification. So. Um, you know, and with a 2x lens, we could double that to 360 magnification. So if you need to measure a hole that's two or three thousandths in diameter, um, you could do that with those higher magnifications. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about a, a little bit on 
something I didn't really see would happen. At the beginning of both the, the run here on the Optiv mm -hmm. and on the, uh, on the SF, yeah. um, you did kind of a preliminary thing, which what helps to just to orient the position of the part. That's right. For those of us who are kind of new to this, this is that you can't really just go in and start taking data. You actually have to understand where the part is in relationship to the to the fixture, right? That's right. So typically, you're loading a part in a repeatable fixture, and uh, the CMM then locates on the part. So you can have a holding fixture, not necessarily a dataming fixture. So uh, the first few hits you see on the part program were uh, alignments. Okay. Okay. Um, we did have an earlier question that we passed right by. Just give me one second here. Yeah, actually, uh, this was, um, you kind of flew by it. Talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit more about the illumination. Uh, yes. There were, what, three different types of illumination? Yeah, uh, we have a bottom light, LED bottom light, we have a top light LED, and a ring light. That, and the ring light especially is programmable, so I can shine quadrant, uh, quadrant light, a light from the right side or the left side to uh, illuminate an edge. And with vision, um, you know, having a clean edge, a clear edge, you get much more repeatable measurements. Uh, Craig had a question. Um, what are the accessories or options mm -hmm. that you can get with the machine? Okay. Uh, actually, um, he said come with the machine, so I'm wondering if, he's, if, if what Craig means is what does this come with and right. what can you get with it as an option? I'm going to interpret it that way anyway. Right. The camera is standard, and then uh, the touch trigger probe is an option. Um, very uh, nice option. And then... Um, one of the major things we change is uh, fixturing, so you can get some flexible fixturing so it's easier to load parts. Um, it comes with a 1x lens, which gets you up to about 180 magnification, but if you need to get into real small features, um, you could go with a, 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 a 2x lens. Okay. And I think we also mentioned earlier, you, did you mention probe changer? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah you can okay. put a probe changer on here, so you can switch from a 1 millimeter probe to an 8 millimeter probe, um, and that fits right on the back. Okay. Um, well, we got about 15 minutes left. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is give our readers a little bit more, or, I'm sorry, our viewers, uh, a little bit more time to get some questions. Now is the time to get kind of your final questions in on the Brown & Sharp SF Shop Floor CMM, as well as any questions on the Optif Classic, and I guess any pe questions on PC Demus in general sure. since, since you're here. So any questions on PC Demus as well. We're going to give you a couple minutes to do that while we get the rest of the guys up here. I'm going to run you another short little video so we can get the guys up and get them all mic'd again. Um, this is a, a little video on Hexagon Services. So take a look at that. We'll be back with you in a couple minutes. Hexagon Metrology is the worldwide leader in measurement systems. We have a long standing history of providing outstanding products. You know, of course, our customer service and support is best in class. So we're able to bring all of that expertise, all of the technical know how, wrap it in a services bundle, and present it to our customers for both short and long term needs. We provide inspection services, we provide measurements for assembly, we also do provide reverse engineering as well as staffing. We do the service, training, applications, technical support. Contract programming, uh, inspection, we do turnkeys, systems work, and uh, we also have full training facility with classrooms and uh, lab rooms. We provide project management of metrology projects also. You know, we've done a lot of great things for our customers. Everything from taking over an entire metrology lab to just doing one-off parts and helping them through a crunch time. Customers today just don't have the staff and the number of people uh, employed that uh, they once did with the expertise that's required. We've made an incredible investment in building a team of trained people and the reason we do it is just another way to separate ourselves from our competitors and to add value. When we really thrive and when we really shine is when we have to literally overnight pull together equipment, pull together a team, show up on site and because that's basically the expectation that our key accounts have for our ability to help them out of jams. When I go to a customer facility, normally I'm called there on site because they have a measurement problem that needs to be solved. And I'm able to look at their process firsthand and to apply the metrology solution that is needed. Right there, he can make decisions as to what processes need to be changed, modified. So therefore, it's a very interactive relationship that we have with the customer. 
We like to plan ahead, we like to think ahead, we like to work with our customers to ask them questions like, where do you want to be in five years? And generally we can plan ahead to develop strategies and then implement them over time. And we partner with customers the, the whole way through from the very beginning interview to the end, the install, the training. We will really, on the front end, create a project map and a timeline and we'll deliver that and review that with the customer before we even begin so that at the end the expectations are clearly defined up front and understood. Part of the job that I love is the self-satisfaction of being able to assist a customer right then and there. So with our portable equipment we were able to go on site, uh, measure the part, and provide the customer answers right there on the spot. And our ability to pull all of those pieces together with the widest portfolio of products in the industry and a team of people that are trained specifically in the applications that our customers need is our big advantage. We have a world of resources at our disposal. If I don't have the right hardware product with me at the time, I can clearly get one sent in. If I don't have the right technical expertise at that point in time, through our worldwide chain, we have just a mass of resources and knowledge at our fingertips. The equipment is second to none. The Hexagon Advantage is the people and the, and the expertise that comes with these people. We have this diversity of products and this team of people to be able to deliver a solution anywhere in the world today. We took our breadth of experience and we began to package it into something that added value to our customers. I love my job. I love to measure. Uh, every job is different. Every uh, problem is different and every solution is just slightly different also. Okay, and we're back. Well, as you notice, we have the entire crew up here, and that's because we've got a lot of questions lined up. So this is actually going to be the Zach show for the next few minutes. We've got quite a few questions on the, on the SF. Okay, okay so uh, first question is from, uh, from Pete Hutchison. Uh, will the shop floor CMM be available in larger sizes than the 454? Yeah, and uh, that's actually a good point. This uh, machine was designed specifically so that we could scale it to uh, larger sizes as needed. Uh, the, the, in the design process, a lot of what we um, made for choices made scalability a real option. And so it's our intention to be able to uh, offer it in a larger size as needed. Uh, okay. And I think you wanted to touch uh, yeah. on yeah. Uh, And also in terms of um, uh, speeds and accelerations, it is, in fact, it's, it's, it's faster than its uh, slightly larger brother or uh, comparable uh, in the discovery line. Um, it's, it's faster uh, in, than that, and it's also comparable to that of a one with about 250 millimeters per second okay. uh, axial speed. All right. Uh, next question, I think, uh, is for you, Dan, uh, okay. Gene Lowe's. Uh, how well does this version of PC Demus integrate into a robotic cell? Yeah, um, PC, we can integrate robotics um, with uh, like a VB type interface. Uh, we do that all the time with our systems uh, group. So um, yeah, we can load the machine from the rear. I mean, it's totally exposed in the rear. So um, it's perfect for that type of uh, set setup. OK. And also, um, there was a question here. Um, for whoever, um, I think this is for the Optive. When will the product be available for purchase? Uh, right now, actually. Like oh. I said, we've just started manufacturing this facility, okay. but they're, they're ready to go right now. And, uh, and, SF for, and for the SF, uh, the commercial launches today, I think quotes are, uh, quotes are out there and, um, okay. and uh, available for sale today. So if you like what you see, operators are standing by. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK. Some more. Oh, well, okay, well, we talked about, uh, this had to do with the, um, the SF, how easy is it to learn, and well, as we know, even your CFO can do it. <laughs> if, if, if our CFO, Mark Delaney, can do it, anybody, anybody can do can it. Do it. Um, uh, we, again, it was designed a lot for having a very simple interface for execution mode, just like any, uh, any standard seated PC Demos, we can have a complete programming station along with it um, by offering it with monitors and keyboards integrated with the system. Um, but uh, yeah, the simple interface is, is, is made so that it's, it's really a single button click in order to run your program. Okay. Um, 
And this, I'm not sure, if th this might be also for you, Dan. Sure. Are the fixtures already in the program? And I don't know whether they mean mm -hmm. the purchase or they mean the fixtures are in, the, in the, your interface, your, your user interface. Right. Um, well, the, the actual hard fixtures, um, the flexible fixtures are is a separate optional uh, piece. But um, all, PC Demos has all the fixturing components, the R&R &R fixtures in the software. So all you do is drag and drop them and put them in there. Um, and then as far as the actual digital pictures, you do that in paint and paste the, the image into the program. OK. So and that was actually one thing we didn't talk a whole lot about. We talked about how easy it is to operate. How easy is it to, to program? Doing everything you're talking about, doing kind of the, the sure. uh, putting in the procedure as well as programming right. the, the, the part itself. Well, the actual touch button interface is made for running the program. Um, but typically, you'll make a program from the CAD model you know, at your desk. So you have an offline st uh, seat of PCMS to do that. Um, if you have to program on the machine, uh, we do a wireless keyboard or a mouse for that option. OK. And also, uh, did we talk about networking, uh, mm -hmm. networking these products? I mean, I know we, we've been running them standalone, but there's no reason why they couldn't be networked into, into some sort of uh, enterprise uh, data collection system, right? Sure. Yeah, we have a few customers that on these shop floor machines, they have five or 10 machines right on the floor. And all of them are networked, so it's all going to one um, SPC package, uh, in, in our case, Data Page Plus. So, um, you know, one, pl one, s one network could uh, handle all that data, one database. Okay. And I'll further that with just, I know of a customer who actually has, a, you know, a very large quantity, upwards of 100, who actually can actually get in and see statuses. Of so they're actually they're they, monitoring real time. Yeah, it, it, once you put it on a network, there's a lot you can do with customization of an, you know, an interface. It's not something that we did, but it's, it's certainly capable. Okay, because the data is the data's there. The it's just a matter of interfacing to your software and sucking the data out of it and doing right. what you want with it. Okay, right. all right. Um, oh, uh, what is the anticipated life of the linear ways? And I'm assuming they're talking the SF? Yeah, the, the, the SF. You know, both machines have linear ways. Both machines um, uh, the, the linear ways don't have uh, a real maintenance cycle to them, and that's probably part of the question. Uh, they they have a they, they are self lubricating. They have a they have a reservoir inside of it, and it's essentially a lifetime lubricant for the, for the ways. So they don't we we don't anticipate that there's ever a need to replace a way after after the time. These are these are the same ways uh, that we have used on existing product that's been out there for years, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know of an instance where we've had to really replace ways uh, the bearing way, bearing rails. Okay, uh, and I think we we also we already touched on calibration, right? That just because you move this from one location to another doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to uh, immediately re recalibrate or something. That, that's right. A, a qualification will, you know, you'll want to do a, a qualification routine, but uh, to not necessarily know to remap the entire thing. Okay. Yeah, and the, and the qualification's a one minute, two minute process. Okay, so it's, it's fast. So it's basically you're going to do your normal calibration schedule for the whole machine, which might be once a year or, or something like that's that, right? right? Okay. Mm -hmm. We have one more question here. Oh, we already asked this. Is, yeah, does PC Demos have the ability to record temperature and humidity? Yes. And that we are. So is there anything else you want to say? I mean, this is kind of what we've got a couple minutes left here. Anything you guys want to mention that we didn't cover on either the SF or the Optif or, or PC Demos? Mm -hmm. We covered most of the major topics. Yeah. And we said they're available for, available for shipping now. So basically everything you guys have seen today, uh, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. And that's right. We're, we're, we're ready to go. All right. Let me do one last check here for you guys who are slow in getting us your, your questions. Now is the time to do it. You only got a couple minutes left or I'm going to leave you hanging. Uh, actually, let me say that. If you do have uh, any further questions and the show ends before you get a chance to send your questions, go ahead and continue to send them to techno-live at qualitydigest.com. Even though the show might be over, uh, the questions will still go through here to the, uh, to the folks at Hexagon. We'll forward them on to them. So if you have any questions, we can still answer them. You'll probably get an answer within, you know, if not today, then, uh, not today, then tomorrow. You'll get an answer to your question. So feel free to keep sending questions even, if, even after the show ends. So. A, uh, a question I had heard earlier about in terms of data entry. Okay. Uh, was uh, about barcoding and, and can we actually take a barcode input, get it into our part program in, in terms of 
when we're doing a, an inspection on a part and it's serialized or you need a part number, the, we can absolutely interface barcoding uh, to yeah. the computer and, and use it as a way of data entry. And I, I would assume probably RFID as well. I mean, they both sure. use kind of the same data yeah. entry, so okay, exactly. yeah. Okay. Exactly. We've I, done that with robotic cells where the barcodes get read automatically or RFID. Okay. And then, oh, and actually then, so that barcode, that, that means that each part, along with mon uh, logging the temperature and maybe humidity, you're also logging that specific uh, part number or serial number right. for that particular device you just measured. So you get trackability if you want that all the way through the system. That's right. Okay. That's right. All right. Yep. We're going to say... Uh, no, no, no. Okay. All right. Okay. Getting ready to jump in. All right. <laughs> Let me take one last, one last look here. Well, guys, I think, I think our viewers have run out of questions. Um, one last, it's still checking here. Just one second. My iPad is, this is the, this is the first iPad. It doesn't uh, run as fast as the iPad or whatever the <laughs> heck they're running right now. Okay, well see, huh? I knew there was a question coming. All right. Uh, what kind of, uh, Tom Mead, what kind of qu cleaning would need to be done daily for issues with the shop floor environment? Contaminants in the air collecting on the machine. So that's a good point. So we, we've already said the Optif isn't shop floor, but the SF is. Yeah. So I mean, Really, what do you have to worry about on the shop floor? Well, one of the things you have to worry about is your, your stylus tip. Because okay. if that's not right. clean, then you're not actually going to get good data. In terms of the actual machine, however, uh, the, 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 the moving parts of the machine, et cetera, all that is covered by bellows, sheet metal. We, we go to, through great lengths to actually protect the innards of the machine so that you don't have to do a daily maintenance on, on the machine. Okay. Um, but uh, of course, you have to keep you have to keep your probe tip clean, and if you don't keep that clean, yeah, you won't get good data. And, and any yeah. you probably you know same thing with your fixture. Anything that's going to contaminate your part or your fixture that's or your right, probe right. tip, you got to make sure that stuff is is kept clean and in uh, yeah. in good shape. Okay. All right, guys. I think that was. Now you watch. As soon as we're done here, I'm going to get 15 questions come in because that's just the way it works. Um, so once again. Um, Dan Farnsworth, thank right? Yep, thank you. And Zach Cobb. Zach Cobb. Yep. And Dan Genlos. That's right. Dan, Dan, we have a cameraman, Dan. He thought that was fun yesterday, running around saying Dan, and everybody says, what? Uh, well, once again, thank you uh, all of you guys for joining us. Thanks again to Hexagon Metrology here in North Kingstown, Rhode Island, for letting us uh, literally take over their training facility for about two days. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of Technorazzi Live. Be sure to tune in tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern for our weekly uh, Quality Digest weekly show, Quality Digest Live, which is a recap of that week's news in Quality Digest. So thanks again for joining us, and we will see you again at the next Technorazzi Live. So long.